Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, no, we are a few minutes early. If you're, if you're looking at your watch going, wait, wait, I still have five minutes. Yes, you do. Uh, but I want to take a moment this morning and invite you guys, if you're watching us on YouTube right now, there's a chat function in there uh, that we've been using for the last several weeks. Uh, and today is Mother's Day. So it's just something uh, to to kind of celebrate moms here before we get started in about five minutes. Take a moment and maybe type out in that chat function your favorite thing about your mom. What's the favorite thing she says or does or uh, means to you, right? Uh, and let's fill that chat space up this morning with, with what moms mean to us, okay? Hey, listen, we've still got about five minutes. We're going to go back to the countdown timer, but, uh, but I hope you guys enjoy that, and we'll see you in just a couple minutes, okay? All right.
Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Mother's Day worship service uh, here at Gallup Hill Baptist Church. Uh, if I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name's Kyle. Uh, I'm the pastor uh, here at Gallup Hill. So if you're a guest with us today, thanks for being here. Uh, welcome to, I know it, it doesn't seem like you're a part of our congregation today, but, uh, but you are. So, and we'd love to know that you're here with us. So if, if you don't mind, maybe uh, if, if you look on the side of YouTube, you'll see the chat where hopefully over the last five or six minutes, people have been saying wonderful things about moms. Maybe tell us, you know, who you are and, and where you're coming from in there. Or uh, if, uh, if, if you'd like to, you can go to our webpage, uh, gallophill.org. Uh, scroll down to the bottom. You can subscribe to our email. I uh, promise we won't spam you on that. We usually send out one or two a week just with some announcements and what's coming up, uh, or you could go on YouTube. If you look right up just on our main YouTube page, there's a connect with us button that you can click on uh, and let us There's a, a more comprehensive communication you can do there. Uh, you can ask questions. Uh, you can get us to pray for things. I mean, all kinds of stuff that you can use. So multiple ways that you can connect to us. We'd love to know you're out there. Uh, we, we can't see you. Uh, I can't see any of you. I know you're there, but... Uh, but anyway, so if you'll give me just a moment, if you're a guest with us today, I have a couple things I need to talk with our church about. Uh, one, uh, and this really goes for, for guests and regular folks, right? There's a new Bible study class coming up next Sunday morning uh, from 9 to 9.45. We're doing uh, a Bible study called How to Read the Bible. Uh, it's going to be six weeks. Uh, I'm going to lead it. Aaron Casavant's going to lead it with me. Uh, we're going to be going through a book called uh, Journey into God's Word. So you'll need to order one of these. Uh, you can get them off Amazon. I checked them this morning. They're delivering by Friday. Uh, they're about 10 bucks. So Journey into God's Word. And, and we're going to be talking about, you know, how do you read and understand the Bible? How do you read the Old Testament law and, and the prophecies and how do you read the Gospels and Revelation and all this kind of stuff? And how do you read it to understand what it means and then to see how it applies to you? Uh, so this is open really to anybody, but you got, you have to register. Listen, Gallup Hill people, right? I'm talking to you because I know how you guys operate, right? You don't sign up for things and then you just show up on Sunday morning and go, here I am, right? You can't do that now, right? You got to actually register for it. So the best thing to do, just take your phone right now. You're watching this on YouTube, on your television. Take your phone. Just send the email to churchoffice at gallophill.org. Just tell us your name. Give us your email. That way, next weekend, we can send you the meeting information. You can log in, right? But you have to register. If you start texting me at, at 845 on Sunday morning, you might get in. You might not. I don't know. So register, people. Uh, second thing, we have 84 of 89 spots filled for our blood drive that we're doing this Wednesday through the American Red Cross. There are five slots left, and three of them are at 115. Four of them were at 115 earlier. Apparently, nobody wants to give blood at 115. I don't know what the, the discrimination against that particular time slot is, but we've only got five slots left. So come on, guys. Uh, come get your blood sucked out for the good of humanity, right? Sign up. Go to the website. There's five slots left. Let's get those knocked out and filled up. Uh, also, if you're part of our children's ministry, uh, you should have gotten a survey this past week with five questions just beginning to, to gather information for us to use as to how we might do things when we start to regather. Children are a huge part of what we do here. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing it in safe ways and ways that you're comfortable with, so we need feedback from you. So check your email, what it came middle of the week, uh, five-question survey, take you, you know, less than two minutes probably to fill it out. Uh, and then send that back to us so we can get that, okay? Uh, all right, I think that's it in terms of, of announcements for today. Uh, don't forget to register for the Bible study, right? Write it down, send it out, do something, send the email now, uh, whatever you got to do, okay? But it is Mother's Day. If you want to open your Bibles, uh, if you got, you know, your, your hard copy of the Bible, if you're pulling it up on, on your phone, open up to Acts chapter 16, uh, Act, book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Chapter 16, and I want to talk to you guys this morning uh, about a mom's influence, okay? It is Mother's Day, right? And we are, if you haven't, public service announcement, right? If you haven't called your mom yet, you've been warned, okay? Do it. Just get on it. As soon as we're done, make that call. But it's, this is actually a day, I didn't know this until I started looking this week. Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson in 1914, set aside the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day, is one day of the year to set aside as a public expression 
of love and of thankfulness for moms. And I mean, think about it. I just sat down this week and, and, and made this list in probably about 30 seconds. Think of all the roles that mom fills in a house. You are nurses, counselors, spiritual advisors, educators, nutritionists, accountants, chauffeurs, maids, peacekeepers, entertainers, homework helpers, cheerleaders. Mom, I forgot my, can you bring it to me, people, right? Night terror guardians, snugglers, breadwinners, project helpers. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. So from us here at Gallup Hill to you moms, whether you're watching this today or you watch a replay on it on Monday or Wednesday or whenever, thank you for your undying love, for your untiring work, for your unselfish giving, and for your undivided devotion. Uh, and this morning, I hope that we take time to honor and bless and thank and encourage you for all that you've done and are doing and will do. So if you're, if you're part of Gallup Hill or, or you've kind of joined us during this digital age, you should have received, uh, if we have your information, a gift this week from us. I uh, should have gotten in the mail a, 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 a gift card to Holmberg's that you can go and get something you want that's good, uh, share with the family. I highly recommend the apple crisp or the chicken pot pie. Both delicious, but uh, you, get what, uh, you get what you want. But we're talking today about a mother's influence and, and about how important it is for your family and faith. And, and I want to encourage moms today that, that, listen, what you do matters, especially the little things, right? The little things that seem to get lost in the chaos and the noise and the crazy and, you know, the teenager, right? I mean, all this stuff, these little, the, the big things you do are important too, but the, the little things that add up day after day after day, week after week after week, that shape who your family is, who your husband is, who your children are, who your friends are, really. It has an enormous influence. And so I want to read a couple of verses out of Acts 16. We're going to be kind of bouncing around a little bit, so if you've, if you've got your Bibles, just get your fingers limber. Um, but Acts 16, verses 1 and 2, is going to set the stage for us here. It says, and Paul, I'm reading Acts 16, verses 1 and 2, it says, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. So Luke is writing the book of Acts, right? Luke is the author. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. That's kind of his first volume, and, and the book of Acts is his second. And he's following the Apostle Paul right now in, in one of his journeys. If, if you're familiar with Paul, right, he wasn't always called Paul. Uh, he was called Saul. Uh, and he was, he was what they called a Jewish Pharisee. So he was a member of the hyper-religious right of Judaism. Uh, he was the, the, the str of the strictest adherence to the Jewish law. And he was a hater and persecutor of the church. Okay? He murdered people that were Christians. He imprisoned people that were Christians. But Saul is traveling to Damascus one day and has this experience on the road where Jesus opens his eyes, really, by blinding him. And, and, and there is a change, right? And Saul becomes Paul. He becomes Paul the apostle. He becomes Paul the church planter. He becomes Paul the New Testament author. Like, if you don't know, most of your New Testament is written by Paul, like Romans to Philemon, Right, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, all written by Paul. Maybe the book of Hebrews as well. And he becomes a church planter. And so the book of Acts, really the second half of it, follows three missionary journeys of his as he moves in increasingly larger circles away from his home church. And it's in that second journey that Paul comes and he encounters a young man named Timothy, who's probably in his early 20s, maybe even his teens, 
Uh, Timothy's mother is a Jewish believer. Maybe she's one of Paul's earlier converts. Maybe she came to faith after Paul went through. His father is, he tells us, is a Greek. I think that's meant to tell us that he's probably not a believer. He's not a follower of Jesus. Uh, so from a faith standpoint, Timothy has one parent, his mother, who is a believer, one parent, his father, who is not. We'll get to that in a little bit more in a minute. Ethnically, he's kind of a mutt, right? Part Jewish, part Greek, but most importantly, what Luke tells us is that he is well spoken of and he's a disciple of Jesus. Right? He's a follower of Christ and, and he's a follower that is, verse 2, well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, well spoken of by the church. And so Paul takes Timothy, he comes and gets Timothy, and in verse 3, it's not going to be up there, but it says Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, so he took him and he circumcised him, right? So Paul's going to take him, he's going to mentor him, he's going to train him, but the first thing he does, right, is he, he says he circumcises him, right? So we know Timothy loved Jesus, because uh, that's the first thing he's willing to go through, right? Then Paul takes him and trains him, and Timothy becomes the pastor of the church at Ephesus, a large, influential church in New Testament times. Uh, the, the New Testament book of Ephesians is written to the church at, at Ephesus, right? Ephesus, that church, is, is still around when, when John, the apostle, you know, 50 years from now, writes the book of Revelation. There's letters at the beginning of that book that are addressing to the different churches. Ephesus is the first one. Timothy is the recipient of at least two letters from Paul, what we call 1st and 2nd Timothy in the Bible, right? Where Paul is writing directly to Timothy. And, and the question that, that I really want us to ask today, right, is how did Timothy become this person? This well-respected disciple, this church pastor and, and protege. Where did his faith come from? And, and Luke hints at it here, but the simple answer to the question, where does Timothy's faith and his character come from? The answer is his mother. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me back to the book of 2 Timothy. Right, this is Paul's second letter to Timothy. This is actually the last letter Paul writes before he is executed. But I really just want to hone in on one verse, 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 5. Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. It all started with his grandmother and his mother. And Timothy had what Paul called a sincere faith, a deep faith, a genuine faith, a faith without hypocrisy. He was a true, deep believer. And it came from his grandmother and his mother. And we know she was Jewish, right? We know she was, uh, she was part of what they called the diaspora, which is the dispersion of the Jews. So she was a Hellenistic Jew, a Greek Jew. So she lived outside of Israel. She likely spoke Greek as her primary language. She likely followed Greek customs. That probably explains why she's married to a Greek man, right? The implications in Acts and in 2 Timothy, right? The father's not a Christian. We don't know what he is. He may be a Stoic, he may be an Epicurean, he may worship the emperor, uh, he may worship Roman gods or Greek gods. Uh, but Eunice is married to him, and in Palestine, and in Israel, this would have been very unusual, but outside, it's more common. But so we know from a faith standpoint, that's a challenging situation, especially then because the father, the male, was the driver of the family. Right? The, the, the males in this society had near absolute authority. So, and, and, and we know this also. I mean, Christian married to non-Christian, I mean, is, is a challenge. I mean, even today, right? Those of you that, that are married to non-Christians or have been married to non-Christians, right? You know that there's this tension that can exist there. We view the world differently. So we know that, that she's a follower of Jesus along with her mother, Lois. 
we know that she's well-versed in the Old Testament. You say, how do we know that? Well, turn the page to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verses 14 and 15. This is later on in the same letter, but Paul says, but as for you, he's talking to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here Paul acknowledges Timothy's knowledge of, of, of the Old Testament. Right, of the scriptures, of the sacred writings, that from childhood he's been acquainted. And I really don't like that word, right? For us, acquaintance means kind of a passing knowledge. Right? The Greek word underneath that word is the Greek word oida. It means to know, to understand. What Paul is saying here is, is you have known the sacred writings since childhood. He's well-versed. Why? Because his mother taught them to him. And let's be honest, that's a pretty amazing acknowledgement, right? I mean, Paul, apostle, church planter, I mean, probably, you know, you got in Christianity, you've got Jesus, right? And then you've got Paul, and then reality is you got everybody else after that, right? So Paul is standing, he's writing this letter to Timothy, and he's saying, look, I get it. The most shaping influence in your life wasn't me. It was your mom, and it was your grandma. That all Paul is acknowledging for all his mentoring and training and tutoring that credit for Timothy's spiritual maturity came from his mother that taught him the sacred writings from childhood. So Timothy's faith was largely passed down by his mother and his grandmother. And so I want to encourage you today, moms, to pass down that faith. Intentionally pass down that faith. What you do is so important and has such influence. So how do you do that, right? How do you, how do you intentionally take your faith and pass it down? I want to share with you four things. If you've got our outline uh, that comes in the email on Friday, uh, you, you can pull that up. Four things I want to share with you. How do you pass your faith down? The very first thing is that you must possess it. All right, this is not rocket science. You can't give what you don't have. Right, everybody, everybody operates on faith. Every single person, every person, every day. Like your life is based on faith. I'm going to flesh this out a little bit more in a minute. But for most people, for the average American... For maybe some of you watching, your faith is actually in yourself. There's this idea of, you know, well, I'm, kind of, I'm, a, I'm a good person, right? I mean, I'm a good mom. I'm a good dad. I'm a good employee. You know, I'm a good sibling. Uh, I'm a good neighbor, good friend. I mean, this is kind of the default position of, of the average American, right? I'm a decent guy and I'm a decent lady, and that's probably true. You probably are. You're, I mean, by American standards, you're probably a good lady or you're probably a good guy. Uh, the problem is, is that that's not good enough. You can't be good enough. Uh, being a, a good guy by modern American standards or being a good lady by modern American standards, by any standard, isn't good enough. Jesus says, uh, in the end, in, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus is going through, he's preaching the greatest sermon ever preached. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, you can just write it down. It's not going to be on the screen. But in Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Right. Jesus doesn't say you have to be better than, you know, that, that neighbor across the street that's really kind of a lousy guy, which if you think about it, any time we're doing comparative morality, right, we never pick somebody better than us, right? I mean, when we, if we do that, we're always like, yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm better than, than, you know, I'm no this guy, right? Nobody ever goes, you know, Mother Teresa, she really doesn't hold a candle to me. Billy Graham, I'm better than that guy, right? We don't make those kind of comparisons, 
But Jesus says, you must therefore be perfect. Right? I'm standing in a basketball gym right now. This is where we do church. We do church in the, in the, in the gym. I'm looking in, in the back, in the far, there's a basketball goal set up. You, you must be perfect. If you play basketball, it means your, your shooting percentage has to be 100%. Your free throw shooting has to be 100% all the time from like five-year-old basketball through the NBA, 100%, right? If you play baseball, right, your batting average has got to be 1,000 from T-ball through your time with the, uh, the Dodgers, right? If you're a gymnast, it's tens every single time. And you go, that's impossible. And you're right, it is. But that's the standard. Perfection. 24, 7, 365. You can see why the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, says we all fall short. Nobody meets that standard. I don't. You don't. Only one person ever did. We all stand before God in a deficit. And that thought can really drive us in, in, in a couple of different ways. Okay? It can either drive us to, to defeat and despair and denial, which we usually just kind of cover up by just not really thinking about it. Just get that out of the head, right? Yeah, what's for lunch, right? Uh, we we kind of just put it out of our mind. It can drive us to despair and denial, or it can drive us to faith. Because all faith is, I mean, it boiled down to its very core, it's a transfer of trust. It's a transfer of reliance. Your work doesn't meet the standard. Being a good guy or being, it's not good enough. But Christ's work does. And I want you to listen. I'm going to read from the, from the book of Romans, right? I've mentioned it several times. If you've got your Bible, like I said, you've got to keep your fingers limbled today, right? Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to read verses 18 and 19. It'll be on the screen. So if you don't want to turn, you can see it there. Romans chapter 5, 18 and 19. Okay, the Apostle Paul, is. this is his exposition of the gospel. What does it mean to be a believer? And he's in chapter 5, and he says, Therefore, as one trespass, one sin, right, led to condemnation for all men. He's referencing Adam. He's just got done talking. He's, he's comparing Adam and Christ, right? Adam, the first created human being, Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, as Adam's sin is now passed down to us, that propensity to sin is that sin nature is passed down to us, so one act of righteousness, now he's talking about Christ, leads to justification and life for all men and women. Adam's sin led to condemnation and death. Christ's suffering and life and death and resurrection that leads to righteousness and justification and salvation. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Faith is transferring your trust that may be recognizing that according to society standards that you might be a good person, but according to God's, you are not. But God loves you anyway. And he wants to draw near to you, and he sent Jesus to come and live that perfect life so that you don't have to. And faith is simply that transfer of trust that I don't trust myself to do the right thing and say the right thing and believe the right thing and think the right thing. But I know that Christ has. And if I put my faith in him, that God will accept me. So the very first thing, right, to pass down faith, you must possess it. If you haven't, it's a very simple act. It's just, Lord, I, I realize I've been trusting in myself my whole life. And I recognize that, that I'm not good enough. Please forgive me. And I, I trust that in Jesus, right, that his work and his life and his death and his resurrection is sufficient. God, draw me to you. You've got to possess it. That's the first thing. And then you have to feed it. All right, listen, guys. Faith, this is the second thing, right? You've got to feed it. Faith is like a muscle. Right? If it's exercised, it, it grows and it strengthens. If it doesn't, it gets all flabby and weak, right? 
The Apostle Peter, again, we're flipping, right? So grab your Bibles. We're flipping to 2 Peter chapter 1. The Apostle Peter writes in his second epistle, 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 5 through 10. Peter says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. Make every effort to supplement, to add to, to supply, to feed. Feed your faith. Right? And, and Peter goes through this amazing list, right? You supplement your faith with virtue, right? With, with excellence of character, with, with moral character. You start living out faith in, in everyday life, living as Christ would live. And, and, and you, you, you take, and so your faith is being strengthened by the life that you're living, right? But your virtue, your, your moral excellence is being strengthened by knowledge. Right? As you, as you dive into the scriptures, that was one of the things that, that Paul said about Timothy, right? Is that he's known the Bible. Your, your, your faith, your virtue is strengthened by knowledge, and knowledge with self control. And I mean, it's just an amazing ladder of steadfastness and godliness and brotherly affection and love. And if these qualities of yours, and they are increasing, it will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful, right? In your knowledge of Christ, your faith will grow. But we have to feed it by knowledge, by virtue, right? You can feed it. I mean, being here on Sunday is good, right? But one meal per week isn't enough. I, one of the things that, that I've really actually become uh, quite thankful for during the time of coronavirus is that it has pushed me uh, and my technological abilities, right? I'm now in my early 40s. I'm 43. Um, so there's a, a kind of a natural progression, right? That is, as you're coming up as, as a teenager into your twenties and even into your thirties, right? Your desire to know and kind of stay abreast of technology is, is on this nice upward climb, but somewhere, somewhere like late thirties to early forties, it kind of starts to level out a little bit, right? And you start to get kind of flat, but this has really pushed me, uh, for that to kind of start climbing again. And one of the things I've found, and I, and I want to encourage you to do, uh, and a friend showed it to me, is, is there's just a simple app on your phone. It's called YouVersion uh, or the Bible app. And if you go, like, I'll, you probably can't see my phone, but I'll pull it up. It's just a little Bible app. And you open this thing up. And inside this app are reading plans, Bible reading plans, all kinds of, of Bible studies that you can do right on your phone that you click and they remind you what you've got to do today. There's reflection questions in them. Everything from, you know, anxiety to how to deal with the virus to studying this book to all kinds of stuff in there. There's even a community in there, right? Several friends have, uh, people have friended me through this, right? Our, this is what our community group uses to do our Bible studies now. Uh, so this is a way, I mean, it's, I, I encourage you, download the app, right? <clears throat> and it's just right there. Feed. We all have these. We carry them with us everywhere, right? And we all have time sitting waiting for a sports game to start or after we finished our run and we're just kind of sitting there catching our breath, right? There are all kinds of opportunities to feed through knowledge. Paul says, you know, supplement your faith with virtue, your virtue with knowledge, right? That's an easy way to do it. Uh, there are Bible studies that we offer. There's connection groups that we do. But think about growth in your faith. All right, listen, this is the best illustration I can think of on this. When it comes to faith, right, and it comes to growing your faith, uh, and I don't remember where I read this, but somebody pointed out, right, only God can provide the wind. Right? Only at the end of the day, right, it's God's breath 
that comes and enters into our, it breathes new life into us. It's his breath that changes us. It's God that changes us. It's Jesus that changes us. Only God can provide the wind, but only you can raise the sails. So if you want your faith to grow, you have to feed it. Guys, you've got to raise the sails. And, and I tell you, like I said, one of the most thank- things I'm thankful for now is, is the push for me back into technology. There's so many different things out there that are available. Uh, I recommend that one. Uh, the Bible app, version is what it's called. Friend me if you go into it. So you have to possess it, then you have to feed it. Third thing, you model it. Like, listen, guys, here, here's the simple truth of the matter, right? You are going to pass down your faith. You can't help it, right? It, it happens every day in, in the things of life, right? If, if your faith is in hard work, you're going to model hard work. You're going to work diligently, whether it's in the house or in the workplace or in the yard or whatever, and you're going to push your kids and your husband to work hard, right, and, and to be diligent, and whether that's in sports or grades, right? And you're going to demonstrate, you're going to pass down your faith through, the, through everything that you do. Or if, if your faith is in beauty, you're going to obsess over how you look or how your children look or, or behavior, right? You're going to kind of make sure that you're always doing the right thing, being the good person, making sure your kids are the good person, and, and you're going to feel really good when they are, and you're going to feel really bad when they're not, right? Or if, if your faith is in success, you're going to push them. Got to get good grades. Got to be on the sports teams. Got to be the cap, right? You're very naturally talk about and model and reinforce what's important to you. So as you nurse, right, as you, you know, put Band-Aids on boo-boos and, and, and counsel and help with homework and chauffeur, what your faith is in is going to come out. So be intentional about it, right? Moms, and, and I mean, this isn't just for moms, dads, siblings, let them see your faith. Let them see you struggle with it. Let them see you, your joy in it. Let them see your reliance on it. Let them see your, you know, your initial possession of it, right? If, if today is the day or if it, you know, share with them, model it for them. Let it come out, not just on Sundays, but on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and all the other days. How does your faith influence your work, and your marriage, and your friendships? Guys, let them see it. Model it. That's the third thing. And then the fourth thing is to teach it. Right? Root them in Scripture. Expose them to the Bible. Uh, Timothy's mother, right? I mean, Paul says, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. Why? Because his mother did. And she didn't have a copy of the Old Testament. Guarantee you, she didn't have a copy of it. She exposed him to it by taking him to the synagogue, by taking him to church, and by what she had in here. She had it memorized. Why? Because she heard it over and over and over again. Listen, Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is the Old Testament, right? So this is, this is something that, that Eunice and Lois would have lived by. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, we have what uh, Jewish people call the Shema, which means to hear. And it begins in verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command to you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. The words of the Lord were on Timothy's mother's heart. She possessed them, she fed them, and then she taught them. How did she do it? She talked about it when they're in the house. And let me tell you something, you're in the house a lot these days, yes? Lots of time to talk about it. She did it while they walked by the way, as, as you hike your trails, right? As you, as you walk through the neighborhood, as you, as you bike around the neighborhood. When you lie down, she, it, it, she did it at night when she, when she tucked little Timothy into bed or, or as they all sat around after the evening meal. And when you rise, she talked about it at the breakfast table. It doesn't mean that you have to carry your Bible everywhere, though now if your Bible's on this, you do carry it everywhere, right? But it means the words of the Lord, they're in here, they're in your heart, and they're in your head, and they come out. 
everywhere. And even if you're like, ah, you know, okay, I don't know if I can do that. I'm kind of new to this. I don't, I've read some of the Bible. I don't get it. Well, guess what? I, I mentioned this earlier, right? We're, we're having a, a class starting next week on how do you read and understand the Bible? I, I can't download it all into your head for you, but I can, we, can, we can go through and give you the tools that you need that when you open this up that you can read it and understand it and what does it mean and how does it apply and then you can teach it. You can't give something you don't have. You can't teach something you don't know. Like I said, this is not rocket science. But be intentional about teaching the scriptures. Timothy was acquainted. He knew long before Paul showed up. Moms, you are an enormous influence. The little things you do, modeling it, teaching, they're going to add up over the course of the life. And if you're here and you say, you know, I came to faith late, my children are already grown. Is it too late? Nope. It's not too late. Let them see how Jesus is changing your life. How he's changing your marriage. How he's changing what you do, what you value, how you work, how you spend your time. Right? A mom's influence doesn't stop when a child just you know, leaves for college or moves out or hits those teenage years where they don't appear to be listening very much. It's never too late until you're gone or they're gone. It's never too late. Possess it, feed it, model it, teach it. You will have an enormous influence. I want to pray today for moms. Uh, it's a little bit of a longer prayer today, but I want to just, uh, just take a moment in Mother's Day prayer. Uh, for all of you that are out there and for all the moms in our communities uh, that aren't with us today, that maybe at another church or maybe aren't at church today, or maybe you're enjoying the warm weather after the snow we got yesterday, you know, 2020, wow. Uh, coronaviruses, murder hornets, uh, you name it, 2020 is throwing it at us. Let me pray, Mother's Day prayer. Dear Father, uh, we approach your throne today on behalf of the mothers whom you have entrusted with the care uh, of your most precious little ones. And we thank you for creating each mom with a unique combination of gifts and talents. We thank you for the sacrifice that each mom gives for her children, for the late nights spent rocking infants, for the hands worn and calloused from washing and wiping and scrubbing and mixing and baking and stirring and hugging and patting and disciplining and holding and writing and erasing and painting and pouring and everything else, Lord. We thank you for the gift of time that moms give for their kids. Whether it's stay-at-home moms or working moms or moms who have some combination of the both, we thank you for the flexibility of moms, for their tirelessness, their perseverance, and their devotion. We pray that you give each one strength that you help her to see in every mundane task the eternal cosmic significance that you place on motherhood. Help her to understand that the most radical, world-changing events may be happening anonymously in her home. Help her to love those in her care. Help her to forgive those who undermine her significance. We pray especially today, Lord, for single moms who must lean solely on you for the fathering of their children. We thank you that your arms surround them, Children who may never know or may never have much of a relation with their earthly father. We also pray for those who may have never had the honor of bearing children, but whose nurturing extends to the many poor and needy who cross the thresholds of their lives. Lord, we pray for those who have adopted children, Father, who are like you, who have reached out and pulled in. God, we pray your blessings upon them. We ask you be the daily bread of tired mothers. We ask you to be their living water. We ask you to be their source of spiritual and physical strength. We pray that the same grace that flowed from father to son to us in salvation will flow from mothers to their children. We pray that each mother rejects perfectionism and embraces the goodness of the gospel. We pray the rhythms of repentance and forgiveness shape every home. Lord, give each mother a worshipful reverence of you the creator and sustainer of life. Help each mother rest in the knowledge that they are but stewards of your children 
and that only your spirit can produce change in the hearts of each boy and girl. May each other find their strength and their rest in you. Most of all, Lord, on this day in which we honor mothers, may we love and cherish the special women that have borne us, have nurtured us, and have prayed for our well-being. May our hearts overflow with gratitude to you who formed and knitted each of us in our mother's wombs. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Uh, I pray that today is a wonderful, blessed day full of joy uh, and enjoyment of your families, whether they are near or whether they are scattered. Uh, I pray God's blessings on each and every one of you and on all those that have been with us today, God. Uh, man, I love you guys. I'm, I'm, like I say, I say this every Sunday, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Uh, but until then, continue to love one another. Continue to take care of one another. Um, I love you guys. We'll see you soon. God bless.